So hello everybody and welcome to our event today which is a fireside chat between Remy Vu and Sir Roger Gifford. We're really delighted to introduce you to this unique event that follows two major financial conferences that happened last week. So first of all I'd like to introduce our two speakers and then as well I'll say a little bit about the events that each of them was responsible for bringing to life last week. So first of all to introduce Sir Roger Gifford. So Roger is the chair of the Green Finance Institute and a senior banker at SCB in London. He was Lord Mayor of London in 2013. Um, he joined SCB in 1982 and prior to his appointment as the UK country head, he led the bank's operations in Japan for six years. He's worked in and around the primary debt and equity capital markets for most of his career. He's vice chair and a past chair of the Association of Foreign Banks in London and a chair of the advisory board of the International Business and Diplomatic Exchange. Um, he was chair of the Green Finance Initiative, which was launched in London in 2016, to focus on growing the contribution of the financial sector to the G20 climate agenda. And he chaired the UK's government's Green Finance Task Force in 2018. He's also an elected member of the City of London Corporation and an alderman for the ward of Cordwainer. So, so Roger was the leading light of a major conference last week called the Green Horizon Summit, which took place in London, but also virtually with interaction from around the world. It took place on the 9th to 11th of November. This virtual summit focused on the role of green finance in the recovery from COVID-19, and it concluded with concrete actions and commitments that financial firms need to make ahead of COP26 in Glasgow. So the key tagline for the summit was, it's time to reset the relationship between finance and the real economy. It's time for private and public finance to get behind the transition to a sustainable and resilient future for all. So thank you very much for joining us, Sir Roger. And I'd also like to introduce Remy Vu, who is an expert in economics and international financial institutions. And he's held high level positions in a career devoted to development in Africa. After serving as Chief of Staff at the French Economy and Finance Minister, he was appointed Deputy General Secretary of the Ministry for Foreign Affairs and International Development by Laurent Fabius and coordinated the finance agenda for the French Presidency of COP21. Remy has headed the French Development Agency, AFD, since 2016 and was reappointed by President Macron in 2019. In 2017, he also became chairman of the International Development Finance Club, which is the leading group of 26 national and regional development banks and a large provider of development and climate finance globally. And he's the author of Reconciliation, an essay in which he calls for a reinvented development policy designed to meet the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement. Now, the major conference which Remy brought into creation last week was called Finance in Common. It took place between the 9th and 12th of November in Paris, but was also a virtual summit. And this was the first global summit of all public development banks. Um, it's seen as a key milestone on the way to the crucial events of 2021, notably the COP26, the COP15 Biodiversity Talks, and the Generation Equality Forum, which will be hosted by France. So the tagline for this virtual summit was that it aims to stress the crucial role of public development banks in reconciling short term counter cyclical responses with sustainable recovery measures that will have a long term impact on the planet and societies. So thank you very much, Remy, for joining us today and looking forward to a nice cosy fireside chat. So to start with, I'd really like to take each of you behind the scenes of these two conferences, which had much in common. They took place online. They sought to bring together broad global coalitions to accelerate action on finance. And they took place at a moment when ordinarily we would have expected to be holding the COP26 talks. So why did you each choose this moment to hold a major finance conference? And what did you aim to achieve? And I'm going to start by asking Remy that question. Thanks a lot, Kate. And um, good, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks to, uh, thanks to E3G for, for the, the fireside chat. Thanks to Nick, uh, Sonia, all colleagues at CIMA, E3G. Um, that, that's most welcome to, to take a bit of time uh, one week after the event uh, uh, to see uh, what we've achieved and what's the way, the way forward, uh, both for both of us, I think, Sir so, so, so Roger uh, and I. Um, you're right, it, it, it was all about COP26. Uh, COP, we, 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 are, we are, we feel an integral part of uh, the process uh, leading, uh, leading to Glasgow, of course, and, and we know that uh, finance uh, will be key uh, 
finance action uh, uh, will be uh, uh, what we will talk about in Glasgow uh, five years uh, after after Paris. Um, and we have to demonstrate uh, that we've made we've made progress. It was all about COP26. It was, it was all about COP21 as well. We will celebrate uh, December the 12th, uh, the fifth, uh, the fifth anniversary of uh, of the Paris Agreement. And remember, at that time, uh, we uh, already um, did our best uh, to mobilize. Uh, public uh, and private finance uh, together uh, and have each segment of the financial system uh, send a signal of, uh, of a will, a signal of um, uh, ambition, um, and uh, we will have to see uh, where we stand. At that time, I already pushed uh, to draw closer uh, AFD, the French uh, International Development Bank, and Caisse des Dépôts et Consignations, which is our very large uh, national uh, domestic uh, public bank. Um, and this, this is also when uh, the IDFC club you were referring to uh, gained uh, strength uh, because of climate, uh, $200 billion now in 2019 uh, all 26 members uh, uh, combined. And, and so we had the, the intuition that uh, to have um, action at scale, uh, we needed not only to stay in, uh, uh, in the international sphere, but of course to, to mobilize um, our own constituencies uh, and, and dig uh, into uh, national uh, forces uh, to uh, support uh, the, um, the international uh, agenda. And the good news, and this is what we try to, I think both of us uh, on our respective uh, side of uh, the agenda to uh, crystallize or to capture last week, uh, is that the, the, the climate message uh, because of the climate crisis has reached uh, our nations, has reached our constituencies. Um, and uh, this is what we what we built. So we, we worked for more than a year to to prepare the the financing common summit. The idea were, the idea was uh, extremely simple uh, to to gather for the first time uh, not only the international development banks but also uh, uh, the national the sub national the four hundred and fifty three. <laughs> of us, uh, meaning uh, $2.3 trillion, uh, meaning uh, $12 trillion um, combined balance sheet, um, meaning 10% of global uh, investments. So, um, and, and of course, uh, push for um, uh, this financial capacity uh, to align with Paris. And, and aligning with Paris means uh, Article 2.1c aligning with development pathways, meaning uh, meaning SDGs. And so um, we, um, we organized about 20, 25 events. Uh, it was based on science. We had a, a very nice research conference called The Visible Hand. You, you were part of it. Um, and it worked. It worked. Uh, we uh, all signed uh, uh, all multilateral development banks, again, all international, all national, or regional, or subnational, um, a joint declaration that is, uh, have a look, uh, that is rather ambitious, uh, notably uh, on, on climate uh, and beyond. The Chinese are within, the American, uh, the US is coming in as well, Europe very strong, Africa, Latin America, the whole family. Um, and this is only a start, of course. Uh, we will try to replicate uh, and um, strengthen uh, in 2021 uh, at uh, each uh, multilateral um, uh, summit uh, in the perspective of a huge uh, success uh, in Glasgow. So this, this global coalition that, that, that is now um, there uh, we also and, and and I turn to 
to Roger on this. Now that we exist somehow as a global coalition, 10% of global investments, now we have to turn to the 90 other percent <laughs> and see how we could um, enter in a, in a very strategic and uh, at scale dialogue with, uh, with private finance, uh, with central bankers, uh, with uh, civil society, uh, with our shareholders, the governments, uh, and see if something uh, new uh, can happen. Thank you very much, Remy. And so, Roger, that's a great cue for you. How do we get from that 10% of global investment to harnessing the 90%? And why did you choose this moment for your conference? And what did you have yeah, to achieve by it? Yeah. I Absolutely. Thank you, Kate, and thank you, E3G, and very good to be with you here down in the middle of Devon for London Climate Action Week. Um, yes, of course, the timing coincided exactly with when COP26 would have been, and from the day COP26 was postponed, I was very keen to keep the momentum around the whole green finance discussion from a London perspective, but also from a kind of private finance perspective. I'm slightly reminded of the old song, um, you tack the high road, I'll tack the low road, and I'll be in Scotland for ye, because... Um, in a sense, what was really impressive really about what you were saying was, and I was struck several years, it's been rhetoric, it's been high level, it's been, we must do something. The development banks are discussing a specific agenda with them. And I'd say that our, our conference was a little bit similar, but with much more focus on private finance and private capital. So um, we, we called it the Green Horizons Summit in order to partly to attract Mark who came along and helped us a lot with the senior figures that we had to cop um, leading up to leading up to COP26. Uh, and showed the power of, of, of what can be done. This this was it. We had 3,000 active registrants. We had over 300,000. Thousand live stream hits, and even if you divide that by I don't know five tweets using the GHA days, if you had two hundred people in the room, you had two hundred people. And that was it. And here we have such an extraordinary audience come in. We also run the Mansion House in London. That had a certain attraction, I think, just half a dozen in the Mansion House by the end of it all. Um, and and the, key, the key takeaways for us were definitely UK and feel, because this was, in a way, the UK setting out a bit of a roadmap towards uh, COP26. Um, and there were, there, were some, there were some very international figures there from Gutierrez and Georgieva and Paolo Gentiloni, Bloomberg, Lagarde, uh, and many others from the international scene, like I think Bill Gates. Um, tremendous, but of course, announcing a green, green deal by the government next year. But he also, uh, importantly, said that the UK would be conforming to mandatory reporting on climate by corporates, and that's where we are. Um, and Mark, Mark Carney's net zero um, was a very positive consensus around the voluntary carbon markets with six key areas of consultation as a paper on attracting private climate finance to emerging markets, looking for discrete hurdles to investment to reach net zero. So we had quite a lot of that, that which came in a, in a concrete way for, um, for, uh, for, for the conference. And, um, and we we feel there's plenty to work with going on at the next year. We'll be able to reinforce the messages and to bring some more out as well about that. I'll turn myself on mute for a moment. Thank you very much, Sir Roger. Um, we weren't too worried about the tractor, but we are having a few difficulties, I think, with your internet connection, which is basically speeding up and slowing down, which meant we missed a few words. Mm -hmm. And I hate to say it because you have such a beautiful background behind you but I think it's probably going to work better if you turn off your video so we have all of that bandwidth for your audio. Um, I will refrain from inserting a comment here about the UK's infrastructure investment needs but let's see if that works better. Yeah. 
So, um, but it was fantastic to hear about. Yeah, I'll do. I'll turn the video off. Sorry right. about that. I think no. the um, noise is gone. No worries. Um, so it's fantastic to hear about you know the you know what lay behind both of these events and you know, some of the key outcomes that came from them. Um, I'm quite interested to hear more about how the two events relate to one another and where the points of intersection are. So it would be great to hear from each of the speakers in turn about what the outcomes of the other event will mean for the agenda that they created. So what do you feel are the key priorities that the events have in common? And how do you think the two agendas can work together in the future towards common goals? So I'm going to go back to Remy for that question. Um, well, somehow the two events um, were, were parallel last week and uh, and you're right uh, time has come um, especially uh, because of the december 12 event and beyond uh, to explore the 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 connections between the two the good news is that we are we are all financial institutions we are all banks so part of uh, the agenda is uh, certainly uh, certainly common uh, and we are able to uh, to understand each other uh, in, uh, in in depth um, and build on our comparative uh, advantage uh, we certainly know uh, what we have to do on the public side uh, we put it down in the in the joint declaration so of course start by uh, aligning uh, our own financial flows. So work um, on, on the methodologies. You know, we, you remember we did it in, uh, in 2015 and we are in the process with uh, MDBs uh, and IDFC uh, to set uh, a common methodology on, um, on alignment. And of course, this is, a, this is a tool that we can share uh, with uh, private uh, actors uh, as well. We know that we have to go upstream uh, and certainly uh, with the help of our shareholders, uh, taking into account our, our public uh, identity, uh, uh, we should originate, help originate way more uh, investable, bankable uh, projects. Uh, we are more patient, we do not have the same uh, investment uh, thesis. Uh, we are managing uh, concessional resources for our governments, the, the Green Climate Fund, uh, the European Commission, and others. Uh, we have to make uh, the best allocation uh, for it. And last point, we, we know uh, um, that uh, we also have to support uh, the governments, uh, the authorities um, in uh, setting uh, trajectories, uh, especially for energy transition, uh, in order to help uh, all uh, financial actors uh, to uh, factor them in their uh, investment uh, decision. And last but not least, of course, uh, we, have, we, we are starting to have many examples of that. Um, bring at scale uh, the risking instruments, uh, co-financing uh, uh, to um, to mobilize um, to mobilize the, the private sector and open uh, new uh, new opportunities. Uh, so so that's that's the plan and the roadmap for for public banks, and we are listening very carefully, of course, to what. Uh, what is um, uh, emerging on the private side. So um, uh, the Green Horizon Summit uh, made a very good point on reporting and we know what TCFD uh, is about, so we're part of it. Uh, risk management is also gaining ground with the support of uh, central bankers and the IMF. And very interesting in the discussion last week uh, in London was also, it's not only about risks, it's also about uh, opportunities. Uh, and this is probably where uh, we should um, work more closely uh, together uh, to uh, unlock uh, the potential for, for um, sustainable or renewable um, uh, projects. Uh, last but not least, uh, 
strong signal mm. also sent by Mark Carney uh, in uh, in uh, his uh, his report uh, on uh, emerging and developing uh, markets. Uh, we know uh, a significant part of the opportunities uh, are in the global south, and we know that uh, uh, a significant part of the savings uh, are uh, in uh, the northern uh, in the northern part of the world. And this is probably where a, a global infrastructure of uh, public financial institutions, of course, uh, connected with uh, private finance uh, like never uh, could help uh, reorient uh, investments where are uh, the most urgent and, and probably profitable uh, needs and uh, opportunities. Uh, to um, to invest. So the, the report uh, last week uh, from the Green Horizon Summit was excellent. Uh, we have seen a way to uh, to connect. It's part of the discussion, and, and I'm pretty sure that in the coming uh, weeks, months, uh, at, at least by COP26, uh, there will be a lot more to, to say and to report. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And that's um, yeah. a solid start. Uh, I, yeah. <laughs> Carry on, sir, Roger. Absolutely, and okay, let me, let me uh, um, because I think I will simply slow down or turn off my video in order to come across a bit more clearly. So I'm looking for a... So, so, Roger, we're still having a lot of trouble and, uh, with your uh, internet connection. This is absolutely key. The conversation between public bodies and... Is that, is that any better with the video off? It was better just now, um, but why don't you, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Okay. Why don't you carry on one more time? But if we have I'll, more trouble, I'll... I might ask you to redial in on the phone. But, but, but anyway, please continue okay. for now, and I'll um, alert you. There, there are, I'm, I'm turned my. Anyway, I'm looking for your hand in case it happens again. Um, in terms of in terms of how we solve this opportunity, private finance will not invest at a lower return or a lesser credit risk than they are paid to do. So the provision of of first class guarantee of important upfront equity of the question of climate change, which is not in the OECD countries. This conversation between OECD countries and and the green the green community is well underway. Every central banker in OECD countries is now onto this discussion. But where we are not yet grappling with it is in developing countries and emerging markets where the political risk, the currency risk. The first loss risk of it, that's where there is such an important conversation with the and the private finance sector. So I, I think that is where we will also really focus for COP26, because the mandate that is given, and I'd be very interested in Remy's views on this, the mandate that is given to the development banks is key. And if they are not given a broad enough mandate, or if we're able to improve the production of private finance. I'll leave it there for a moment, Kate. I'd be very interested to Remy in whether you think the mandate for private banks, for the development banks can be broadened to include more of the, of that early risk that banks Okay, so we still Thank you. So we do still seem to be having a lot of trouble with Sir Roger's connection, and we'll see if we can sort that out. But I think we did manage to pick up there a question for Remy around whether the mandate of public development banks, you know, can be broadened and adjusted to maximise the mobilisation of private finance by um, reducing risk for private investment. So Remy, do you want to respond to that in the meantime? Uh, probably for at least uh, three decades, uh, uh, we have lost uh, the sense of uh, what a public development bank is about. Uh, 
it was even well we we had no name actually to uh, encompassing uh, concept to 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 identify the whole uh, the whole community of public development banks you there are the multilateral development banks there are the yeah, dfi there are, the DFI, yeah. there are um, promotional banks uh, many many appellations many names uh, uh, and it somehow it uh, demonstrated that uh, what these institutions are about uh, was unclear. Um, and so for many people, um, you had on, on one side the governments and their, and their fiscal capacity, uh, and on the other side, uh, the markets and, and, and private finance. And, and probably we have lost um, track of... Uh, the fact that in so many economies, and probably in each and every economy, you you have a, you have a public financial institution uh, uh, in between, uh, and for exactly the reasons uh, uh, Sir Roger was uh, was mentioning, is that you you need uh, um, a bridge uh, between public uh, future uh, priorities uh, transformation and what uh, private uh, actors uh, expecting. Uh, returns of course um, and profit uh, can uh, can sustain and so um, it's not about you remember all when we talk about crowding in crowding out subsidiary i think all these uh, words uh, are um, outdated uh, now we, we we more clearly see uh, what's about private finance and what's about public finance and now as come the time to explore uh, the way they will uh, intertwine, uh, interlace to, to unlock, yes, way more projects. It's of course particularly visible uh, and true uh, in developing and emerging countries for sure, because uh, the financial sector here is uh, missing uh, key uh, elements uh, to function uh, uh, in an appropriate uh, way, but it's also true uh, uh, it's also true in, in our countries, uh, where we know uh, that the transformation is, uh, is huge. Uh, there's a lot of investment gaps uh, where public and private can work together. Absolutely. I, I, Remy, if I can butt in, Kate. I, I'm on a new machine now, so hopefully it's a slightly better connection. Um, Remy, I think that's absolutely fascinating. I really do. I, I, th this, this, to me, is one of the great opportunities that lie, lie ahead of us. And, and it's, it is absolutely correct that the amount of money that wishes to invest in this area is huge. The amount of money that is looking for a home in this area is absolutely huge. And this is demonstrated time over and time again by, by many of the, the UNPRIs and others that are out there. But we haven't yet solved this combination of public and private, the blended finance that we talk about. And I think your remarks are really, really, really important, actually. And so the risk, uh, for the risk management, uh, the, the returns that public banks are expecting are different, for sure. Uh, and as long as it was, uh, it stayed unclear. Uh, it's not to say that we will, uh, we are lost uh, machines. Huh? We have, of course, to to keep a robust and sound uh, business model, uh, but it's not exactly the same. And this is mm. a discussion we should have uh, between private finance, uh, public banks, central bankers, and the governments uh, in the months. Kate, if I may, if, may I make one other point that uh, there is occasionally a bugbear for me? Um, and, and I've mentioned Remy's views on this too, because as a practicing banker, I think there's one obvious but often forgotten point. And that is that financial services are just that. They are services to the economy. They're services to the society we live in. And we need change and we need it at a local level. What, what you and I eat, the, the plastic goods that we buy in the shops, what we wear. And, and, and banks are often expected to make all the changes that are out there but actually it's the companies that they're servicing that need to make the changes. It's you and me as, as customers and the preferences that we have that we need to get changed. And I often think that we have an over, overly high expectation on finance and financial institutions for what they can achieve, because frankly, they must support their customers, that they're providing jobs and taxes, paying taxes in a way that the economy cannot do without, as we've seen from the last nine months of COVID. So, Banks and investors can do a lot. They can express preferences. They can 
they can stop financing certain activities such as coal, or they can, they can certainly sell the stock in companies they don't like because the reputation's bad or they're using the wrong social practices or even the sourcing in the wrong way. But we need much, much more of that in order for you and me to change our buying habits and to express our preferences more strongly. And then I think you'll find the banks and institutional investors very supportive of, of, of the new agenda, which is around a sustainable, uh, cleaner, greener future, whatever words you like to choose. But I, I hope the, the expectations on banks are, are reasonable and not um, that they are the masters of the universe because they simply aren't. They are simply servicing sectors of the economy which need servicing. Um, in that respect, I think maybe they have a different role from the, from the development banks, and certainly the multinational development banks, who are more, have a government mandate, of course, to support. Uh, whereas we have a shareholder mandate to support, and it's a quite a fundamentally different approach to, to the business we're able to do. So now we're getting into the thorny difference between consumers and citizens, which yes. could run and run. Yes. Um, excellent. So I just wanted to, sorry to butt in, but I just wanted to say to those watching this webinar that I have a couple of more questions up my sleeve and it's great to see Sir Roger and Remy getting into their stride in any case with the discussion but we'd also like to get a bit of a q a from the audience so you know you can start thinking about that now and lining up your questions using the q a function which you will hopefully have access to um would it be okay if i went on to a slightly different subject um i had a question to Remy in particular around the global context in which these conferences sat so you've had a distinguished career working on both African development and French public finance. And France has been a leading champion of green financial reforms internationally. But we're at a difficult time right now in the global economy. Um, the World Food Programme has warned that three dozen countries could experience famine by the end of this year, which would double the number of people globally who are food insecure. So what do you see as the priority financial actions to be taken now in order to ensure that the developing and emerging economies of today can not only address this crisis, but also become the growth engines for the 21st century economy? Um, well, um, we, we know the risk of uh, decoupling. Uh, we know uh, how drastically um, financial flows going south are drying, uh, are drying up uh, these days so we cannot uh, underestimate um, the dramatic impact of the of the crisis so yes the and 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 for now i would say um, uh, the the stimulus uh, goes only uh, national or regional so there, there's no real uh, uh, international dimension uh, to what we are doing to uh, escape from 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 the crisis, for good reasons. Uh, we start by uh, answering the needs uh, uh, of our of our populations. Or, or um, and and the good news is that the the previous trends uh, for international uh, finance for ODA um, is is remaining the same. I mean, we, we, are, we are on a positive on a positive trend. We see that for climate finance as well. You've seen the last OECD figures, uh, these 79 billion euro uh, out of 100 uh, we have to mobilize uh, in 2020. So we're not there yet, but the trend is good. The trend is good, but we, due to the depths of the crisis, we need to accelerate and increase the flows. Uh, uh, drastically uh, if we want to play our, our counter-cyclical role. So this is certainly um, beyond the debt moratorium that was decided by the G20. Uh, there's a huge uh, question of solidarity um, in the coming months uh, to help, uh, yes, Africa and, and beyond. I mean, the poor, the poor countries uh, of the world. President Macron has invited uh, leaders uh, to a summit next uh, spring uh, on um, uh, how to finance uh, African uh, economies. Uh, um, pretty sure that by then, a uh, question of sovereign debt, question of uh, non-sovereign financing, question of uh, there was a, there was a four billion pledge during the financing common summit uh, to support uh, for the year for for next year uh, uh, SMEs uh, SMEs in Africa. Uh, we know there's a very high risk of default uh, very soon. 
and we need to have a backstop, uh, an international backstop, uh, way higher than uh, what we have achieved. Uh, for now, this is what uh, Kristalina Georgieva, what David Malpass, what uh, all multilateral actors are asking for, uh, Antonio Guterres uh, as well. Time for uh, strong, uh, decisive decisions uh, will come. So we have, the, we have the G20 summit at the end of this week. Uh, and as uh, public banks, as private banks, uh, uh, Sir Roger is right. In the end, it's about demand. It's about... Uh, uh, it's a political issue at the highest sense of it, but at least last week, uh, both of us, I think we demonstrated that uh, if, there's a, if there's a momentum, if there's a signal, uh, our institutions uh, better organized at a global level and, and, and well coordinated uh, can do better than, than before. Mm. You know, Kate, I think, I think there's... Um... Some, some of the responses we had last week, and, and Remy, very interested to hear what you had. Some of the responses we had were almost demonstrating anger. And it's the sort of anger that says, we're not moving fast enough. You guys carry on talking all the time. You're looking absolutely beautiful in your suits and your ties. What are you actually doing about it? And I think that this, we, are, we have reached in the last year or two, a very interesting change in public attitude towards sustainability and towards climate. Maybe there's an element of fear here. Maybe there's an element of COVID lockdown has given people more time to think about it. But I think we're reaching the situation where society will not forgive us if we don't move. Because society, people, are convinced that there is an issue here to address, not only in climate, but also around plastics, around deg land degradation, around deforestry, around the oceans. They are convinced there is an issue. They want us to do something. And I think this is fundamentally different from introducing a new product to a market when we, you know, we're trying to sell something new. And if electric cars were to be sold just on their own, I don't think they would sell because they are not necessarily as green as we say they are. They're inconvenient. We've got to put in new electrification all over our towns and dig up the roads again. Gosh, we love digging up the roads in Great Britain. And here we do it again for electric cables. I don't, but I think that the, the feeling out there is such that people want to see action. And I think when it comes to the developing markets in particular, emerging markets, there's a very strong feeling that for mitigating carbon, we must act. And there's a feeling that it should be commercial, of course, everyone's got to get the right terms and conditions in the right ways. But again, I turn to the role of, the, of our government institutions, our, our major global uh, infrastructure uh, organizations, the United Nations, the World Bank, the IMF. And I think the question is very firmly in their court, what do we do now? How do you bring private finance along? Because there's a, there's, there isn't time to waste here and there's a growing public feeling of anxiety and anger. So Roger, I was going to ask you a, a similar question really about the political era that we're in, but maybe I can ask it to you with a slightly different slant in that you held the Green Horizon Summit in the context of a new incoming administration in the United States. And um, you know, next year we will see the UK having fully withdrawn from the European Union. And this is on top of the issues that we've just been talking about right now in relation to the COVID pandemic. So to what extent did you take all of that into account in the way you designed the Green Horizon Summit and how did you try to speak to those concerns? What signal would you want to send to the rest of the world about the UK's commitment to sustainable financial reforms? Well, it, it will not be of any surprise that the, the Brexit was at the back of our minds when we were designing the GHS 2020. And, and part of that is that we want to show that London and UK financial services, and particularly in, in the area of thought leadership and, 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 and direction, strategic direction around, uh, around the whole uh, sustainability climate finance area, we want to show that that's alive and kicking and we're very determined to be part of the global discussion around here. Equally, as we often say, it's a global discussion, the solutions are local. Um, the mortgage market isn't the same in the UK as it is in France or Sweden or Germany or anywhere else. So, but the, but the, 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 the summit was designed around bringing global figures together to send a single message of solidarity around the need for action and the need for change. And as I was saying earlier, what was very impressive about Remy's um, conference was the practical nature of it, the very determined uh, it didn't include absolutely everybody in the world. It was focused specifically on the development banks and what they could do. 
And I think that's that kind of um, messaging is very powerful becomes the more specific we are, the more practical we are, the better it becomes. So yes, um, a long way around us saying that the, the, the Brexit discussion was very much behind it. We think it will directly feed into the, the G20 agenda. Um, certainly the UK has a very strong ambition um, to, to, be a, to be alongside the other countries working together with France and, and others in, in terms of how we take it forward. So we want to play an absolutely equal part. I think it was very interesting that the government is saying that they will almost certainly do as well as the EU taxonomy or possibly even better in their terms, but certainly they will embrace the EU taxonomy approach um, as it comes forward. Uh, the practical details, of course, on that won't be known until December 2021, and that's probably when we'll see if there are any differences or between the two, but that's, that's certainly coming up. And of course, for the US administration, it's a, it's, a, it's a funny old world, isn't it, when the US is actually quite a good leader in green finance. They're doing quite a lot in green bonds, even though the administration has had a different, uh, a different hue to their uh, different sort of greenness to their activities. Um, I very much hope, we very much hope that we'll see the leadership that we saw from the States before come back. Uh, we'd love to see the, the, the US alongside all the other major nations in, in a degree of concern and action that they wish to see. Certainly US players, New York, California, uh, and elsewhere. I mean, look at the number of wind farms in Texas, for goodness sake, are really, are really uh, acting, but we would love to see the administration put out strong messages there too, alongside the others. It, it helps everybody, if, uh, helps all global investors and indeed global borrowers if they know that there's a, there's a single united voice arguing for, for one, one direction at the top of it all. So I, I'm, I'm optimistic with Mr. Biden when he gets in there. <laughs> Fantastic. So I'm going to open it up a little bit to Q&A from the floor now as well. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions that have come through from the audience. I'm actually going to sort of mix these together because I think they're related and I'll open it up to both of you. So can public banks change private banks? And indeed, can public banks change the private financial system? And if they can, how? Um, and you know, the related question is that in order for public development banks to attract and de-risk private investment from global north into global south, do the public development banks have to move away from traditional lending um, and towards de-risking instruments like guarantees. So can I start with Remy on that one? And Remy, you're on mute. No, on this, um, it's, it's, a, it's a debate, it's an ongoing debate, but uh, uh, of, of course we're not starting from nothing. So um, as I said, $2.3 trillion a year. Um, there's a lot that is already uh, uh, connected uh, with private and leveraging and mobilizing and co-financing with, with, with private finance, of course, uh, has always been. Uh, remember that uh, in many countries, that's the case in France, uh, uh, markets were even uh, created sometimes their infrastructure uh, their animation by uh, by 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 public banks the the, the green bond market uh, too much for now at least uh, was created by uh, by the world bank by eib uh, by uh, dbsa in south africa by uh, by others and and now um, uh, they have to we have to, all of us to be rewarded for that uh, in order for the green bond market to uh, to explode and then the, the sustainable bond market that is only starting uh, uh, will um, will implement we are also uh, uh, of course um, intervening in uh, so many deals uh, alongside uh, private investors this is the case in the north this is also the case uh, in uh, developing uh, in developing markets and i think we have demonstrated uh, CDC in the UK, which was a one of the one of the partner of the Financing Common Summit, or or Proparco, or the European DFIs, that well, we have a quite um, a solid and profitable uh, portfolio in the global south. The the returns for Proparco in Africa are are are, are excellent. So we we have uh, we opened somehow the 
the way and demonstrate that it's possible to do business uh, in the, even in very poor settings. And we see uh, private investors, at least before the before the current crisis, um, uh, increasing uh, uh, their their flow. So that that's for deals. Uh, uh, opportunities and now the the other question is uh, can um, can public bank help um, institutions uh, themselves transform uh, and this is where uh, uh, technical assistance this is where methodology this is uh, what we we are doing with so many colleagues uh, public and private uh, financial institutions to set uh, the best uh, procedures uh, internally, to have uh, the proper uh, human resources uh, internally uh, is, uh, is, is so promising because my, my, my hope is that in the end, uh, the market will recognize um, uh, institutions uh, when they will have demonstrated that, that all their financing is aligned uh, with climate and SDGs. For now, we have to have a pot of, uh, of good projects in front of uh, our green bonds. Uh, in the end, I want, I want uh, AFD to be 100% to be financed by green bonds. I see, I see no reason why I should have a, a traditional um, bond issuance uh, while uh, uh, we are 100% aligned with the Paris Agreement. So this, this is, we have to pass from project, uh, the risking project, to uh, transforming uh, institutions uh, uh, themselves, uh, and then and then the whole the whole market uh, at the time. Yeah, and if I come in there, Kate, I, I think there were two questions there. The first was, can public banks change private banks? And I'm not sure I recognise that as a as a desirable idea in, in, a, in a world where we have free will and free enterprise and free free capitalism. Um, I think the word is cooperation and working together rather than changing. But I think if you mean that do you can you change their aspirations and change the ways that they work? Yes, there are definitely ways where public and private can do much more together, as we were discussing earlier, and we can bring the weight of private finance, both banks and investors to bear in a much greater way when the credit structures, the return structures are right. I don't mean excessive returns. I mean, they just have to be right for the shareholders of the, of the institution. It all comes back to our pension funds and our, our investments or the investments of the, of, the, of, of the organizations we work with. And there's just no sense in saying they should be uncommercial or that they shouldn't be taking excessive risks. But we can work together with the institutions mandated by the government, the development banks and the multinational development banks to achieve those aims. Um, in, ter in terms of the, of, the, of, the, of the second part of the question, which was about kind of the degree that, I think was about the degree which um, green finance can, um, and just let me remind myself, um, move, moving away from traditional lending towards other forms. Yes, I do believe that's the case. I think there are many opportunities to look at guarantee schemes as part of that new involvement between public and private, um, exactly as Rumi is saying. It, it, it's, it's more about the risk than the, than the form of the risk. So. Um, what, does that make sense? No, it doesn't make sense. It's more about the, 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 the what is the see-through risk to what you're eventually taking on, rather than whether it's a, a first loss equity or a first loss guarantee or, or, or elsewhere. And um, I, I think guarantees are, are a very interesting way forward. Yes. Great, thank you. So um, we have another question which um, has come up. It's been particularly asked for Remy, but I'm going to actually address it to both. So the questions around um, just sort of the ambition of some of the outcomes from the conferences and um, the original question was about how we can work harder to ensure that public development banks cease investment in fossil fuels. And of course, there were some sort of declarations and commitments around that coming out of the conference. Some of them, you know, could we would need to go further to get to the point of fully um, phasing out fossil fuel investment. And I would like to open that up to both um, speakers because of course there were a number of um, different declarations and reports published around Green Horizon Summit 2, including private sector announcements that talked about phasing out from fossil fuel investment but didn't necessarily talk yet about all fossil fuels or have specific dates. So mm -hmm. it would be great to get perspectives on both and how we can accelerate that within the financial system. And I would like as the moderator to tamper that by saying that while phasing out unsustainable activities is hugely important, how can we also ensure that focus on scaling up the finance into sustainability that we so badly need at this time? So Roger, I'm going to start with you this time. Okay. Um, uh, absolutely. And, and I think the 
I, I would come back to the power of the markets somewhere in this, because no company likes it when their share price goes down. BP has not enjoyed the last seven, eight, nine months. Um, partly that's for reasons, of course, of, of COVID, but also there, there, are, there are market forces out there which all the oil companies are having to watch very closely. So the, the oil companies that have moved and shifted, like Orsted, like Equinor is doing, have seen a remarkable transition in their market capitalization, their share price, which companies love. So it, it's a bit, the, the power of the markets is, is fantastic for making companies change the way they are. And, and, and that comes back to my earlier point about what people want to buy, what pension funds and institutional investors want to buy. If they don't want to buy uh, oil companies, then, they won't, then the share price will go down because it's market supply and demand. And I think we, we, we neglect how powerful that is, or, we, or we, we sometimes ignore how powerful that is as a tool. It's a tool we have. We don't have to recreate this tool, it's there. And it's the same for plastics in the oceans and the, the, the declarations that are made by some of our major trading companies, not very long after the David Attenborough program on life in the oceans and Blue Planet 2 came out and showing terrible, terrible views of dolphins and turtles choking on plastic. There were some very smart new methods of plastic management brought out by those major companies soon after that. That's very powerful and can often achieve change more quickly than a government directive. Um, so again, coming from the private finance point of view, Kate, uh, I, think, I think we can work with those both on the share price level and in terms of exclusion. Most banks now will, or most OECD banks, Western banks will not finance new coal plants. It's been a, a bugbear for them. They've had some pressure the odd bank in the, in the odd far part of the world has, 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 has slipped through that net, but that is the drive that we're heading for. We can't do it yet for gas. We just don't have the alternative energy ready to do that. You would lose too many, people would lose power to their homes and the hot water in their houses if you did that. So we need governments to invest swiftly in new methods around, yes, around wind and solar, but also around investment into hydrogen in, and into other methods of, um, of carbon capture possibly around existing gas. One, one last point around the conclusions from both our summits was this. We now have, I can't remember how many companies, enormous number of countries looking to a net zero targets. And that's great. But the next stage, the very key next stage is putting definition around those net zero targets and the strategies to get there. So it's all very well the UK saying, oh, we're going to be, or China saying we'll be net zero by 2060 got to see plans for how to get there because that will affect investment strategies energy investment strategies and and therefore particularly in emerging markets and developing markets how we get the finance in place for that and how public and private will work together to achieve that great thank you so remy what, what are your thoughts on this and not be particularly interested in your thoughts on this controversial question of how fast we can phase out gas of course, uh, I strongly disagree with uh, with Kate in the in the in the Q and A. Uh, um, we worked hard, and I think uh, you have in the joint declaration of the financing common uh, a clear and strong uh, direction. Uh, I don't know if I can say it's it's a commitment when you have uh, so many institutions. Uh, uh, on, on board and uh, certainly count on uh, observers, on think tanks, on the and civil society uh, to, to pay attention to what will, uh, what will happen. Um, in the declaration, probably you've noticed that uh, there's a strong language on, uh, on exit from coal financing. So the idea is to, to define explicit policies to exit from coal financing in the perspective of COP26. So um, we have a, a, a clear timeline uh, uh, to demonstrate. And, and this, this was a, a, a sentence that was uh, uh, discussed uh, extensively with uh, Asian, uh, Asian colleagues, uh, especially uh, with the Japanese um, public banks. Um, and the good news is that, no, yes, Sir, Sir Roger is right. Now that the political commitment uh, has been uh, taken uh, in Asia uh, to reach carbon neutrality by uh, uh, mid-century, uh, now the question uh, has landed at the level of, uh, of um, 
policies of uh, public financial institutions uh, who are closer to the ground. Uh, and we will have to hear from the actors uh, the way they will implement uh, this uh, highly uh, political and significant pledge uh, of, of carbon neutrality. And somehow we, we tried to phrase it, we be began to phrase it uh, last week uh, at the Financing Commons Summit. We, we have also um, committed to um, uh, uh, apply more stringent in investment criteria on energy transition. So it's, it's not yet uh, close uh, all fossil uh, uh, financing, uh, but certainly uh, consider the range of these investments in our portfolios, uh, avoid uh, like uh, uh, commercial banks stranded assets more and more um, and push uh, the governments to set uh, more uh, ambitious uh, trajectories. And, and on the other side, of course, uh, uh, strongly increase uh, the pace of uh, investment in renewable energy. This is already what, what we see. Huh? Uh, I was referring to the amount of um, climate finance, uh, the IDFC, uh, uh, is originating on a, on a yearly basis. So last year it was $200 billion. Uh, More than 100 were coming from China, uh, from the China Development Bank. So, so we're going hopefully uh, uh, in, in the right direction. And then you have this very uh, strong pol pol commitment to align our activities with the objective of the Paris Agreement. So it's, in the end, it's a question of methodology and there's a lot around. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that uh, by COP26, uh, we, we will converge on, on a single methodology of alignment that could be shared with, uh, with private actors. It's not, it's not only for, for, for public banks. Uh, uh, and the discussion is, is ongoing. There are too many of them for sure uh, for now. But if uh, UK and Italy, uh, also because they are chairing the G7 and G20 next year, uh, make a strong push on uh, ex exactly what Sir Roger said, what uh, carbon neutrality means, uh, what uh, are these uh, long-term trajectories, uh, where is the multilateral place to see if a country goes in the right direction or not, uh, for the market to, um, to factor this in, uh, and what's the methodology of alignment for specific uh, financial institutions, it would be a, a major progress. And I think we can accomplish that uh, a year from now. That's a great note to leave us on, Remy, because, um, you know, I guess I would agree from my observation of the two events and the various debates and discussions that are going on right now that this question of what does Paris alignment look like and how fast do we need to move is really the debate and the conversation of the, of the, of the financial the climate sector at the moment and um, so the work that's been going on in terms of public banks around Paris alignment that all aims towards COP um, is obviously mirrored by work that the UK is looking at doing in its capacity as President Executive of COP and some of the work that Mark Carney unveiled for the private sector in terms of alignment with net zero so yes I very much hope that these things do come together and coalesce for COP and that there are more discussions about this in coming weeks and months. Um, I should obviously declare an interest in this from the U3G side. These are topics that we work on all the time. And I know there was you know, questions that we didn't get to in the chat, which were um, you know, also connected to the question of fossil fuels. So I would like to direct any interested people to some recent work that E3G did recently called Exploring the Case for Ending Public Finance for Fossil Gas. So do go and have a look at that on our website. We have a lot of good facts and figures in there. Um, but I would, I'm, I'm afraid we're almost out of time, so I'm really going to need to wrap up. But I'd really like to thank both of you for coming and sitting by the fireside with me. It's been um, a really wonderful opportunity to bring you both together and understand the context that both of these events sit in. And I'm really struck by, you know, Sir Roger's use of, I'll take the high road and you'll take the low road. And we'll both end up in Glasgow. I'm going to have the song going around my head for the rest of the day now. So thank you very much for that, Sir Roger. Um, it's a, you, take the, you take the public road, I'll take the private road. I think it's the, <laughs> the alternative you have to come up with, Kate, and work some words around that. Uh, yeah, I'll see what I can do with that. I'm not sure it scans very well. Um, no. But um, 
I also like what you said that we're trying to get all finance to be green and remember this mainstreaming point and that society will not forgive us if we don't do more at this crucial point in the world's economic adventures. Um, but it sounds as though there's a lot to build on. So there are new types of partnerships um, to look at, the new types of financing where public and private can work together and a really an opportunity to look at the mandates of public banks understand how they can better mobilize large-scale private finance and also the sense from you that private finance is really very close to that tipping point where it's clear that this is the direction that large-scale financial flows need to go to help us achieve that climate transition and climate safety so that's a very encouraging note to end on i'd like to thank you both very much for joining us today and thank you very much to all of our audience and for the questions as well thank you thanks to you all bye-bye Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, E3G. Thank you. Bye.